Alvin Guldner was a renegade sociologist who, in fact, described himself as a ridge rider between two sorts of intellectual practices. On the one hand, sociology, and on the other, the sort of critical Marxist social theory that we would find in the Frankfurt School and in such contemporary Marxists as Jürgen Habermas. In his early work, Guldner was often concerned to use uh, critical Marxism as a means to uncover the ideological biases and one-sided distortions that, at least in his mind, characterize the practice of academic sociology and social science and theory in general. But it was in his later career that he offered what I would call turnabout by offering a Marxist critique of Marxism itself. And this was contained in a fairly remarkable trilogy of books written in the late 1970s called The Dark Side of the Dialectic. And they were The Dialectic of Ideology and Technology, The Future of Intellectuals and the Rise of the New Class, and The Two Marxisms. Uh, by applying the techniques of Marxist ideology critique to Marxist ideology itself, Guldner practiced a sort of uh, Socratic form of inquiry and criticism where he raised critical issues, which he characterized as a sort of outlaw Marxism. And I want briefly to quote from him uh, on the practice of uh, outlaw Marxism. The Marxist outlaw's insistence on the absoluteness and inescapability of contradiction, his insistence on a critique grounded in such a universalism, means that the Marxist outlaw is a Socratic or Marxist Socratic in the sense that the Marxist Socratic critiques Marxist establishments and stands outside of them. And this obviously represents a dangerous position. As Guldner states, being the critic of all positive doctrines, searching out their limits, the Socratic is necessarily suspect in the eyes of all who offer and all who ache for a positive doctrine. In the end, then, the establishment and those who aspire to succeed it. In other words, both the old and the young will accuse him of, quote, poisoning the mind of the youth. Thus Socratics are, and are made, outlaws. Clearly, however, Marxist outlaws have not surrendered the dialectic, but continue to probe and wander its dark side. Only those who can move without joining packaged tours of the world can afford such a journey. And I would argue that in deploying Marxist ideology critique against Marxism itself, Guldner revolutionized the way we think about so society, uh, politics, and even world history. So in this lecture, we're going to look at the three central issues raised in each of these texts. First, the uh, analysis of ideology and ideology critique contained in the first volume, The Dialectic of Ideology and Technology. Uh, then the defects in the Marxist scenario for modern class struggles contained in this rather slim volume, volume, The Future of Intellectuals and the Rise of the New Class, and then finally his archaeology or interpretation of the development of Marx's oeuvre in The Two Marxisms. So let's begin with this analysis, historical analysis, of the emergence of, ideolo of ideology. Uh, Guldner notes that ideologies emerge in the mo modern period, in fact the term I think was first coined in the Napoleonic era, as a response to the breakdown of what we might call the discursive credit of traditional authorities. We might think, for example, of aristocrats and clerics in the Ancien Regime, whose speech was credited by social inferiors simply on their basis of their position within a traditional hierarchy. And we'd seen this uh, form of authority developed by Weber. Um, all of this source of discursive credit for both aristocrats and traditional authorities and clerics was destroyed by the American and particularly the French Revolution. And a new ground for political discourse was found in uh, what Guldner calls the modern culture of rational discourse, which is characterized by three distinct features. The first is that all assertions in the culture of rational discourse must be justified without reference to authority. Either the authority of one status in the social hierarchy or by appealing to other authorities, a technique we'd seen in scholastic philosophy. One validated one's philosophic position by showing that it fit with the scriptures or with the writings of Aristotle. The second feature is that assent to uh, uh, 
positions and arguments must be purely voluntary. One does not convince one of the truth of a ideological or political position at the end of a bayonet point. Okay. Finally, it demands that all assumptions in this mode of speech must be made explicit, as must all inferences. One cannot say that a liberal social democracy produces the best society, and I have many arguments to uh, validate this, but I simply don't have time to present them. It is, as it were, a sort of game of show and tell. One shows one premises and tells uh, uh, the inferences that are drawn from those premises to one's ideological and political conclusions. In this sense, ideology is like social science, and for that matter, Marxism, because they all speak in this idiom of, ra of modern rationality. And Guldner argued that it was, in fact, relatively rational and therefore an advance over traditional forms of political discourse and action, which had been based, again, on appeals to tradition or naked uh, advances of self-interest. Ideologies were able to respond to this crisis in credit uh, that was created by the uh, French and American revolutions because of a communications revolution, uh, particularly a communications revolution in print media that had occurred in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. One feature of this was the emergence of cheap rag paper, which fundamentally uh, lowered the cost of both production and consumption of print media, journals, newspapers, uh, magazines. The second was the fact that uh, at that moment, the uh, print media were controlled by relatively small, privately owned, uh, and decentralized units of production, which is to say it was not particularly expensive to open up a printing press and start a journal. And this resulted in a dramatic explosion in the number of newspapers and journals in the period, a uh, quite dramatic explosion, both in Europe and in uh, the United States. Guldner notes that these uh, media, these newspapers and journals, which it is important to remember were always intensely partisan, ideological, and uh, politically oriented, supplied a venue uh, for the diffusion of ideologies, which both reported the nature of the world and contained commands as to what we should do next. And it was these ideologies uh, contained in these media that served as intermediaries between, on the one hand, literate publics who read them, and on the other, the realm of politics. So we could then say that the rationality and origin of ideology are tied up with these print media, and in particular, what is presupposed by them, the act of writing. And this is important because if you think about it, writing is a very decontextualized mode of discourse or speech. Um, which is to say, when, I, when you speak to someone you know, uh, they don't really need to make all of their assumptions explicit. You know the context in which they're speaking. Their gestures may carry a lot of information. Their social status may carry a lot of information about what their agendas are. But on the written page, one has none of that context. One has none of that sort of background information. So everything must be laid out uh, in the text itself. And it's for this re very reason that uh, printed writing is the ideal medium for that culture of rational discourse that characterizes uh, modern uh, epoch. Okay, ideologies function, according to Guldner, to unmask each other, which is to say they expose the hidden occluded interests that lay behind them. We might here think of uh, Marx a as an ideological critic of British political economy, showing that, in fact, uh, the British political economists assume the very thing which is at issue, the rectitude of private uh, property. And Marxism does this by recontextualizing classical political economy as an ideology, and thus uncovering its biases and class interests. So the rationality of each ideology is limited because it claims, as each, ideo each ideologue claims, to be, unlike all of his competitors, completely and entirely disinterested. Each ideology and each ideologue claims to be the only one to speak purely on the basis of uh, a will to truth. And thus ideologies deny their basic weakness, their basic flaw that they are, in fact, determined by the interests both of their formulators and of their ad adherents. So, I don't want to suggest that uh, Guldner believes this is a unique flaw in ideology. Uh, 
Guldner thinks it's also shared by social science, which also has that same, uh, despite its claim to be value-free, uh, occlusion of its own interests. But it's particularly damaging in ideology, because all ideologies presuppose a unity of theory and practice. And given that unity of theory and practice, the tendency to see oneself as disinterested gives rise to what we have noted in the history of ideological politics, the phenomena of fanaticism and self-righteousness. Okay. Now, since ideology is a variant of this culture of rational discourse, with its fixation on public objectivity and the grammar of rule-bound inference, it's profoundly tied up with those persons who are immersed in that culture which is to say that ideologies uh, don't appeal broadly and universally to all members of society. Those who are more deeply immersed in that culture of rational discourse, i.e. those who are more educated and more trained, are more attracted to it. Thus we find that ideology tends to be a strong element in, the, in its appeal to cultural workers, artists, humanists, uh, painters, writers tend to have much stronger ideological convictions than common lay people. And of course, most pointedly, uh, university campuses, right, which is the place where one finds the strongest ideological convictions. Well, such ideological critique for uh, Guldner raises the possibility, which we'll ex explore a bit later, of an ideological unmasking of Marxism itself. And we'll see that this raises the question of how, as a social science, which purports to be the ideology of the proletariat, it was in fact first revealed and subsequently sustained, uh, sustained by trained academicians and others immersed in this culture of uh, rational discourse. All right, I want now to turn to the uh, second volume, uh, that dealing with the future of intellectuals and the rise of uh, the new class, which really uh, chronicles what Guldner believes were the fundamental flaws and defects in the traditional Marxist scenario of class struggle. And to put it quite briefly, Guldner believed that the traditional uh, scenario that Marx had deployed for class struggle was fundamentally wrong. Marx believed that social revolutions would occur in the most advanced industrialized societies between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. But in fact, the major social revolutions did not occur in that context, but rather um, in more backward countries. And they rarely involved the proletariat, they generally involved the peasantry. Moreover, the peasantry was not mobilized by a uh, radicalized proletariat, but rather by vanguard parties uh, organized in a Leninist fashion, which were comprised not of workers, but of Marxist intellectuals who had come to define themselves as professional revolutionaries. And this is critical because such Marxist intellectuals and professional revolutionaries play no role in traditional Marxist theory. This leads Guldner to conclude that the real class struggle of the modern epoch is not between bourgeoisie and proletariat, but between what he calls the old class, the moneyed bourgeoisie, and the new class, which we'll see is made up of two strata. The larger strata are what he calls technical intelligentsia, a group whose growth uh, and economic and institutional importance in the last century has been just phenomenal. We mean by this doctors, lawyers, engineers, uh, we mean as well uh, people trained for bureaucracy. Uh, and indeed, we should also include within this people with MBAs, CEOs who don't own stock in their company. These are essentially new class people. We often refer to them as professionals. The other strata is the older strata of traditional humanistic intellectuals, philosophers, uh, literary critics, historians, etc. Such a pattern of class struggle between this new class uh, and the old class, in fact, does in a certain sense fit better with the traditional theory of class struggle, which uh, uh, is, in fact, always between elites. Now, this is confusing because Marx had sort of pulled a fast one in the manifesto. He says, uh, history is the story of class struggle, master against slave, uh, lord against serf, uh, bourgeoisie against proletarian. But that only shows up in the manifesto. When Marx actually looks at historical class struggles, they're always between an old elite and a new elite. So the real class struggle was between the uh, patricians of Rome and the newly emerging class of equestrians or knights. The real medieval class struggle was between the old class, the feudal aristocracy, and the newly emerging bourgeoisie of the cities. Uh, so then the modern class struggle would again be between two elites. 
Such an interpretation would claim that Marxist revolutionaries mobilize workers or peasants through ideologies which occlude the interests of those intellectuals as members of a sort of cultural bourgeoisie or experts endowed with a kind of human capital that they acquire through higher education. And it's precisely this that Guldner argues explains why Marxism was never able to account for itself. Because, at least in part, Marxism is, at least, is an ideology of a revolutionary and radicalized intelligentsia that is using the working class or the peasantry to overthrow its bourgeois rival and seize control of state and economic power. This again has the virtue of describing the actual state of existing socialist regimes, where it's quite rare to find proletarians or working class people in positions of authority. If you recall during the old Soviet Union, that most members of the Politburo were quite educated. And if one joined the party without educated education and tried to move up the hierarchy, one was usually sent to a university. They all held uh, positions either as doctors or engineers. Now, obviously in the West, the class struggle between the old class and the new class has not been revolutionary. But it is apparent, particularly if we look at, say, uh, corporations, where there's a clear struggle between shareholders and CEOs, a struggle which emerged in the 1980s with the phenomena of corporate raiding. Figures like T. Boone Pickens and other uh, corporate raiders and takeovers basically appeal to stockholders by saying, your CEOs are a professional salaried bureaucracy who do not represent your interests of maximizing profits. Right. Therefore, takeovers will allow us to remove some of their power. They've come to control uh, corporations and allow us to pursue a maximization of profits. Um, and certainly, this was an argument that John Kenneth Galbraith had used to justify capitalism by saying, in fact, in modern corporations, the bourgeoisie doesn't, may own but doesn't control the means of production. It's actually controlled by professionally trained intelligentsia. We can also find this in politics. Uh, Guldner argued that the Republican Party really is the representative of the old class, uh, of the uh, money bourgeoisie, the National Association of Manufacturers. But the Democratic Party is not, in his view, primarily the agent of the working class. Rather, uh, it appeals largely to uh, the new class of general and humanistic intellectuals. Right? who are overwhelmingly democratic. And here he follows the research of Seymour Martin Lipset, who had shown that the higher you get in the ac academic hierarchy, the farther to the left your convictions move. If you get to the very apex of the top positions at Harvard, you're likely to find yourself among anarcho-syndicalists or communists, whereas most academics are just left liberals. Uh, and in fact, the new class's control of technical information, information which is essential to business and industry, and revolutionizes the means of production, gives it an advantageous bargaining position with the old class relative to, say, the proletariat or lumpen, proleta or lumpen proletariat. And uh, this is reflected in, in the fact that despite occasional overproduction of professionals, they still tend to generate far better perquisites and higher incomes uh, than traditional skilled or even, or obviously, unskilled labor. Now, part of what constitutes this class, uh, according to Guldner, is its human or cultural capital, the fact that it believes it can generate income or has a right to derive income from its higher education. But it's also unified by its shared culture of critical discourse, that mode of rational, uh, modern rationality. And it's this culture of critical discourse that makes the new class, that makes intellectuals and intelligentsia feel that they are, in some sense, ep epistemically superior to all other classes, and that they have a superior social rectitude insofar as this culture is predicated in voluntary assent and forbids reference to authority or the social position of the speaker. They thus feel they are, in a sense, the most reasonable group in society. And we might think of this culture of critical discourse as a sort of modern logos, which speaks in the ear of uh, humanistic intellectuals and intelligentsia and gives them the right to conceive of themselves as sort of modern-day uh, platonic philosopher kings. Uh, as Guldner says, it's this culture of critical discourse that gives them a platonic complex. Um, I want to conclude this part by saying that Guldner sees this class as flawed. And it certainly is. It's jealous of its prerogatives. It has an 
inordinate sense of itself, value, and uh, an inordinate will to power. But nonetheless, it is committed to the public rationality exposed and uh, essentially contained within that notion of a culture of critical discourse. It's also characterized by at least a minimal commitment to a notion of social justice and an almost constant critique of authority and uh, various forms of uh, exploitation, racism, and patriarchy. Thus, while flawed, it still might be a true universal class. Uh, again, in Gouldner's phrase, it might still be the best card history has left to, pay, to play. All right, now I want to turn to that third text, that which deals with an archaeology of Marxism. And we'll see that it confronts the problem of traditional Marxology to produce something which he calls nightmare Marxism. Now, traditional Marxology, or the traditional study of Marxism, distinguishes between two different sorts of Marxisms. Uh, one is critical Marxism, which is found in Marx's early Hegelian or Romantic writings. Uh, Professor Dalton expressed this. It deals with the problem of alienation. And it's also found in 20th century voluntaristic Marxists like Lenin, Gramsci, and Georg Lukács, as well as the Frankfurt School and, obviously, Jürgen Habermas. The other tradition of Marxism is known as scientific Marxism, and that's found in Marx's later writings, most notably Das Kapital, and in the writings of econ economi excuse me, economistic Marxists in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, as well as uh, con uh, later 20th century structural Marxists like Louis Althusser, and the sort of positivistic techno-determinism of Gerald Cohen. Each of these Marxisms claims that it is the true and essential Marxism, and that the other is a distortion of the true teaching. Now, Gouldner argues that this dispute exists precisely because there is a real disparity in Marx's work. They reflect the different interests Marx had, uh, as well as the different interpretations of his work, from either, on the one hand, a humanistic intellectual position, hence critical Marxism, or from a technical point of view, hence scientific Marxism. Well, Gouldner wants to replace this dualism with a tripartite theory, in which he treats Marxism itself as an example of a more large uh, phenomena, that of theory construction. And, of course, Gouldner was profoundly influenced by the work of Thomas Kuhn's. According to this paradigm, uh, Marxism, like all theories, are a sort of intellectual property that theorists may claim to. Okay. So in the first phase of theory construction, Marx drew together the basic elements and structures of his theory of historical materialism. And we saw that that was based on the problem of scarcity and the primacy of the productive forces, as well as the ubiquity of class struggle. This cult period uh, culminates for Marx in about 1848 with the Communist Manifesto. Having laid out the basic structure of the theory, at this moment, Marx and Engels are at their most critical. Critical because, first, they are most likely to criticize other authors and theories, and claim to have transcended philosophy and mere ideology, um, and critical as well because they want to confront the contradictions of other theories. One might think of this uh, in a brief sense as ha once having constructed their basic views from elements drawn from a wide variety of sources and surrounding socialisms, Marx and Engels are immediately concerned to demarcate their socialism as scientific as opposed to utopian and uniquely theirs. They are, at, in a sense, demanding an intellectual copyright for their doctrine. It's the, in the second phase, Marx and Engels take their paradigm, right, their primary theory, and begin to apply it to various test cases. We find this in the Grundrisse, the civil wars in France, and uh, the 18th Brumaire of Louis Napoleon, <clears throat> as well as their vi various musings on what they call the Asiatic mode of production. And this phase really comes to a close with the onset of Das Kapital. And what happens in this period is that Marx begins to find that there are a lot of anomalies in his theory as he begins to apply it to cases. Take the class struggles in France. They begin to take on a chaotic element. Right? Uh, initially, Marx had held, well, the class struggles in France are between bourgeoisie and proletariat. But the more he looks at it, he begins to say, well, you know, it may not be between bourgeoisie and proletariat, maybe between bourgeoisie and peasantry, the classic struggle of town against country. Yet even that seems to be less than completely adequate to him. At one point he argues, well, maybe it's really the uh, 
bourgeoisie against the lumpen proletariat, the dangerous class, and in that way is a sort of proto-fascism. And then finally says, perhaps actually there is an, another independent agency in the struggle, the state itself, which is obviously heretical in traditional Marxist theory, because we know that the state is really a superstructural agency of the ruling class, not a separate agency. Similarly with the Asiatic mode of production. Um, again, the basic problem here is that in classical China and India, it's not clear that aristocrats and lords, or even peasants for that matter, actually own the land. Right? They don't have a fief in that land, as Weber showed us. They have the right to der derive income from that land, as do peasants, but that's based on their service to the state. Land ownership seems to belong to the state. And therefore, once again, the state emerges as a relatively autonomous institution in contrast to traditional uh, Marxist theory. Moreover, the Asi Asiatic mode of production undermines the proprietary nature of classes. Classes can't be based exclusively on relations to means of production and ownership because no one seems to really own land here. And this, of course, raises a problem for uh, Western societies where we might also find that there are classes that are not proprietary. Well, having found these anomalies, in the third phase, Marx and Engels turn their back on them. Right? This is the period of theory construct consolidation that we find in Das Kapital. Rather than change the paradigm, to uh, fit the anomalies, they defend the primary paradigm against vulgarizations, try to dismiss the anomalies as less than critical, uh, and formalize the theory by looking at a paradigm case that will work, that of England. For Gouldner, it's this second period, that of paradigm application, that transitional phase between the first and third Marxisms, that is, in fact, the most interesting and fruitful. It's interesting and fruitful because the anomalies it generates uh, which Marx and Marxism subsequently ignore, um, are critical to understanding something he calls nightmare Marxism. Well, let's look at these anomalies again. The first was that the state might not always be a superstructural agency, i.e., it might, in fact, be a separate power and agency. And this is threatening because if, in fact, uh, Marxism had always implied that the state would wither away under communism because it was a superstructural agency of a ruling class. And once classes were gone, uh, the state would disappear. But if that's not the case, if the state is in fact an independent agency, then the dramatic centralization of state power under the dictatorship of the proletariat and subsequent socialism might in fact lead to a sort of disastrous totalitarianism. Now the second uh, anomaly was, the, uh, as you recall, that not all classes might be uh, proprietary which means that Marxism might not cover all social classes in Western Europe and, in fact, might not even work particularly well in explaining Eastern Europe where most uh, feudalism was pre bendel These anomalies together, as I've suggested, constitute the basis of nightmare Marxism, which he calls the sort of hidden and subterranean fears that ultimately led Marx and Engels to stop pursuing them. Now, the first and more trivial fear is that Marxism might not be a scientific socialism at all, but rather in light of its many uh, anomalies, just another utopian socialism. This is the view that Cardinal uh, Newman had proposed when he said Marxism was really just the last Christian heresy. It's the last social doctrine where the meek will really inherit the earth. But the deeper fear is that Marxism, as a theory of proprietary classes, has failed to see that it was Europe's unique experience with private property that led to its Promethean dynamism, its constant revolutionizing of the means of production. In this nightmare, Proprietary classes turn out to be a necessary condition for technological and industrial development. Uh, and as such, it's a, a condition unique to contemporary European capitalism. And that the abolition of private property, therefore, doesn't really eliminate scarcity so much as usher in an industrial version of the static Asiatic mode of production, a sort of new oriental despotism. In short, the nightmare is that the bourgeoisie were right after all. That private property is the key to the advance of civilization. So in conclusion, I want to say that uh, obviously the dark side of the dialectic is a vast project and resource. Uh, Gouldner's commitment to Marxism, even of the outlaw variety, is a matter of his own moral consciousness. But his discussion of the role of intellectuals and intelligentsia is a fundamental transformation in social theory. And his analysis of the origins and rationality of ideology and theory construction shed light on important problems not only in the sociology of knowledge, but also in political and cultural history, as well as the history of philosophy itself. Why have philosophers had such a platonic complex?
I would urge that the historical implications of Guldner's findings may prove far more profound than even he suggested. While professional engineers and technicians are indeed a new class, a new social strata, humanistic intellectuals are as old as human history itself. So are non-technical intelligentsia, like lawyers, scribes, priests, and Mandarin officials. Far from a new class, they might well, with the peasant, be the oldest class in history, and their platonic complex might be the Western form of their yearning for their traditional position, that of the rulers of a hieratic city-state or oriental despotism.